Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to this uh, second day of the map of the last uh, session of the day. Uh, we are here. We will have this uh, this session two presentation. Uh, the first one is from Paul Norman, and is, he will present uh, the the talk titled Op Map OpenStreetMap Standard Layer. We use it. Hello, welcome to my talk on the OpenStreetMap standard layer and who's using it. To start with, who am I? I'm a member of the Operations Working Group, the group responsible for the planning, organization, and budgeting of OSMF-run services and servers. Independent of that, I'm also a maintainer of OpenStreetMap Carto and other parts of the rendering stack. I'm not here representing OpenStreetMap Carto, OSM2P SQL, or my employer. This talk is about the OpenStreetMap standard layer, so what is that? It's a default map on OSM. Everything you see outlined in red is the standard layer. It's most of the front page. We use OpenStreetMap Carto as the style, but OpenStreetMap Carto is also used elsewhere. There are other map layers on OSM.org, and I encourage you to try them but they're not run by us. At the high level, this is the overview of the technology the OWG is responsible for. The standard layer is divided into millions of parts, each of which is called a tile, and we serve tiles. OSM updates flow into a tile server where they go into a database. When a tile is needed, a program called RenderD makes and stores the tile, and something called ModTile serves it over the web. We have multiple render servers for redundancy and capacity. We're completely responsible for these, although some of them run on donated hardware. In front of the tile server, we have a content delivery network. This is a commercial service that caches files closer to the users, serving 90% of user requests. It is much faster and closer to the users, but knows nothing about maps. We're only responsible for the configuration. The difference between the tile store and the tile cache is how they operate and size. The tile store is much larger and stores more tiles. Only cache misses from the CDN impose a load on our servers. We have a usage policy for the tile layer. Our priority is providing a quickly updating map to improve the editing cycle, but we welcome other uses that don't interfere with that. This is the big difference between what we manage and most commercially available map layers. Most of the time, it takes a few minutes for your edits to make it onto our map, while the other providers take between a day and several weeks. We prohibit some activities like downloading every tile for a large area because it puts an excessive load on our servers. This is because we render tiles on demand and someone scraping all the tiles in an area is downloading tiles that they will never view. We also have technical requirements so we can identify the apps using our tiles and that they behave well with our caching. If you're looking at using the tiles, check the policy for details. With the switch to a commercial CDN, we've improved our logging significantly and now have the tools to log and analyze logs. We log information on both the incoming request and our response to it. We collect enough information to see what sites and programs are using the map and additional debugging information. Our logs can easily be analyzed with a hosted Presto system, which allows querying large amounts of data in log files. I wouldn't be able to do this talk without the ability to easily query this data and dive into the logs. So let's take a look at what the logs tell us for four weeks in May. Although OSM.org is used around the world, most of the usage correlates to when people are awake in the US and Europe. It's tricky to break this down in more detail because we don't currently log time zones, but some upcoming changes will make this a bit easier. Based off of UTC time, which is close to European Standard Time, Weekdays average 29,000 requests per second incoming, while weekends average 21,000. The peaks, visible on the graph, show a greater difference. This is because the load on weekends is spread out over more of the day. 
On average, over the month, we serve 27,000 requests per second, and of these, about 7,000 are blocked. 7,000 requests per second is a lot of blocked requests. We block programs that give bad requests or don't follow the policy. Before blocking, we try to contact them, but this doesn't work if they're hiding who they are, or they frequently don't respond. There are about 700 invalid requests per second. Of these, a quarter are for Zoom 20, which we've never served, and the rest are buggy software requesting tiles that don't exist and will never exist. Of the 5,000 blocked requests per second, two-thirds are not sending a user agent, a required piece of information. The rest are a mix of blocked apps and generic user agents which don't allow us to identify the app. There are about 1,700 fake requests per second, nearly all of which are scrapers pretending to be browsers. To look at where users are viewing the standard map layer from, we can use country data with what's called a tree map. The area of each box is proportional to the tiles per second and they're grouped by region. This lets us view data in a hierarchy and see both the totals for a region and individual countries. Per country usage is what you'd expect looking at other OSM metrics. Germany, the US, France, Poland, and Russia are the top five countries. 60% of the traffic is coming from Europe and 9% of the traffic from Germany. A related question is which countries the OSM.org tile traffic comes from. This is a measure of time spent on OSM.org browsing the map, not how often the OSM site is viewed. Usage from the OSM site is more heavily weighted towards Germany, while proportionately the traffic from France, the US, and South America is much lower. Europe is up to 73% of the traffic, while Germany is up to 20. There are some surprises here, like China. In China's case, this comes down to fakes. There are 50 TPS claiming to be for, um, viewers of OSM.org, but half of them aren't really and are fakes. I've spoken of apps and browsers, but what are they? There's more sophisticated ways to break them down, but for the purposes of this talk, browsers send a referrer header to indicate what website they are requesting from while apps send a user agent to indicate what app they are. Apps can be mobile-based or desktop apps like QGIS, Marble, or ArcGIS. This isn't perfect because some apps incorrectly send a referrer, and some browsers are set up to not send one. Most requests come from browsers at all times, with a higher portion on weekdays. Our architecture has a content delivery network in front of our servers, and the ratio of requests that it can serve out of its cache is important because it determines the load on our servers. Cache it ratios vary with what the user is doing. Panning around and viewing new areas will result in viewing tiles that aren't cached and put more load on the servers than a map where everyone views the same area. Besides this, High zooms will have a cache hit ratio that is lower because there are more high zoom tiles. You can see that OSM.org, QGIS, and JAWSM users have behavior that results in a lower cache hit ratio than the average website or app. This is a tree map showing all the tiles traffic. Websites are on the left and apps are on the right. You can immediately see two large areas of usage, other. This is the long tail of usage. Ideally, I'd put all these small users on the tree map, but the software I'm using errors when you give it tens of thousands of sites to display, and you'd never be able to see them. I mentioned cache hit ratio before, and it's important because what you see here is not the load they put on the OSMF servers. We can get that by looking at cache misses only. This tree map is only cache misses. Compared to the last slide, there's a lot more usage from the OpenStreetMap website and more traffic from apps, particularly editors and GIS apps. Some users, like the RailSys app, have completely disappeared. 
This is because it was requesting the same 20 tiles over and over again, likely from a broken testing script. We can dive deeper into each side of the tree map, starting with websites. The biggest single website use of the tiles is OpenStreetMap itself and related sites like Open Railway Map. You can see usage by a large number of government websites like the Polish COVID site, the Colombian zip code tool, the Hungarian government office appointment tool, and across the U.S. Federal Police public website, among many others. The large number of requests from localhost is odd, and I haven't fully figured out what's going on. Many of the requests are from mobile devices. Looking at the other websites, there's a mix of geospatial sites, shop locators, and basically any site that needs a map. The largest site here is half a percent of the total traffic, and the smallest is 10 millionths. So we're really looking at the long tail of small sites, each of which isn't a large source of traffic by itself. What really matters is the load on our servers, so let's look at that instead. The OpenStreetMap category has gone from 19% of all website traffic to 43%, because users of these sites are more likely to zoom in and pan around. Aside from this, the top sites have shifted around a bit. But let's get back to the big picture and look at the app side on the right. Apps tend to have some user agents that stand out as large users. The biggest are QGIS, RailSys, Street View, Firefox 88, MyProxy.Example.com, and ArcGIS. Some of these have very little backend load because they have a very high cache hit ratio. I mentioned RailSys before, and it has no backend load, but Firefox and MyProxy.Example.com also have very little backend load. This is the backend load. It's what I look at the most when checking on the service. QGIS is the largest app user by far, and we can look into them in more detail later. Street View is an OSM editor, so we encourage their use as part of the OSM editing cycle, and the same with JAWSM. Map Proxy is an interesting one. The largest Map Proxy user is the ADS-B Exchange website, which is an aircraft tracking site. They proxy OpenStreetMap tiles to reduce their demand, but they're obviously a very popular site. They also appear in the websites side of the tree map because you can select between the proxied tiles and getting them directly. Let's look at QGIS, since it's the largest non-OSM use of the tile servers. The OpenStreetMap standard layer is the only map in QGIS by default, so if you want to quickly put together a QGIS project with a base map, it's probably what you'll use. A question I had to look at recently was the load of QGIS relative to the OpenStreetMap site. What matters for load is not the tiles per month, which is 3.4 billion for OSM and 1.2 billion for QGIS, but the peak traffic. The 95th percentile traffic is 2,100 tiles for OSM and 1,200 for QGIS. You can see QGIS is mainly used on weekdays. This is because it's a professional GIS program, while mapping is a personal activity for many, and some of us can only get out to map on weekends. By the way, commercial pricing would be 200 to 400,000 euros per year for OpenStreetMap and 70 to 150,000 euros per year for QGIS. Because QGIS has a low cache hit rate, it sometimes has more load than OSM.org. Overall, the QGIS backend usage is 75% of that of OSM.org, again based on 95th percentile usage. This talk has been about the usage of the standard layer, but what's going to be changing from the OWG for this layer? Preparing this talk revealed some areas of improvement, but help is needed. In the next slides, I'll be linking to the issues tracking the topics if you want to help. 73% of our render load is in Europe, so it needs more capacity than elsewhere. 
Right now, we have two OSMF-owned servers in Europe, with four donated servers in Europe, two in Australia, and one in the US. The donated servers in Europe have fairly low capacity. Europe is our busiest region, but we haven't scaled the capacity there in a long time. We have two new servers that will be adding capacity. They will be hosted by the Academic Computing Club in Umeå in northern Sweden and by the OSMF in Dublin, Ireland. If you're part of an organization that could help, see the wiki link. A change we made recently is how the CDN picks the backend server. This has improved the load on the servers by segmenting the work between them better. You can see the graph showing that the work the servers need to do significantly improved when we made this change. Right now, zooms 0 to 12 are re-rendered once a month. With increased capacity, we can look at changing this to be more frequent, improving the mapper feedback cycle. A lot of this talk was based on log analysis, so it's no surprise that I found some holes in what we currently log. In addition, browsers are changing what headers are being sent, and we need to keep up to date on what we log. These changes will improve identification of fakes. I didn't make changes to the logging configuration yet because I wanted to finish the log analysis for this talk, but this should be happening soon. We used to provide a list of what tiles are accessed, but this stopped with the commercial CDN and logging changes. I've written code to restore this, but it requires someone to configure it with Chef. I'd also like to publish the data behind the graphs I made daily. This is a lower priority than the tile lists, but it would allow community members to look at this data more regularly. Right now, it's difficult to identify our users automatically, requiring user agent or referrer parsing. It's also easy to fake being from OpenStreetMap.org. We also have the problem we don't know our users and we can't contact them about major breaking changes. API keys would help with this, but they'd be a big project. If you want to help and get involved, there's a few ways. We have a public site with reports, although we're currently behind on our monthly reports. You could help write them. For our public work, we have a public issue tracker on GitHub. You can always email us to contact us, either about helping the OWG or the sysadmins. We're also on IRC and host meetings every other week on Big Blue Button. So thank you, Paul, for, for your very interesting talk. Thank you very much for, for the presentation and for also, I say, all the team of the operation team that is working and doing this operation in OpenStreetMap, uh, for OpenStreetMap and for providing us a very useful service as you presented and very widely used services. We saw that the service is used very in very in multiple parts of the world and very in, for different usage. Uh, we have uh, multiple questions. Uh, I'll start with the first one. Uh, you talk about uh, bots uh, regarding the, the, the dialogue usage. Uh, which bots uh, are uh, excluded? So, um, if you're, if, I'm not sure what you mean by bots. It, if you're talking about stuff like search engines, those are excluded by the uh, ac by the standard mechanisms of a file that specifies what to exclude. Uh, if you're thinking of programs that scrape, uh, those are included in the statistics, but those are generally blocked. Uh, if they've been blocked, they don't they didn't appear, for example, in the tree map graphs. Um, could you pull up the just waiting for a slide? Yeah, maybe we will see it a little bit late. Okay, maybe you can. So yeah, this is this is one of the slides. Um, so in a, in the chart like this, you'll see that there are uh, so a lot of the apps. In some of these, uh, like uh, for example, Street View um, is uh, something that I believe was scraping. Um, 
So it, 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 this is actually one of the reasons why API keys would be useful is that it's very hard to identify um, without looking at each particular case uh, what what's going on. Um, for example, I know that I found this out after I recorded. I know that the local host, a lot of that is coming from an uh, open source program called Mapfish, Mapfish Print specifically. And I've identified some traffic that is claiming to be from OpenStreetMap.org, but is uh, not actually from it. Yeah. So there can be some workaround that can try to, to explain, but maybe you have to know the different tools to understand how they use it. So there can be, it's quite tricky. They try to hide, but it's possible to discover them. But it's it's a little bit complicated, let's say. Okay, we have another question about uh, um, if you make an estimation of uh, the amount of tile usage that came from not mappers. So, okay. Um, we can look at the traffic that comes from OpenStreetMap.org and from editors, and that's about 10 to 20% of the total traffic. Um, it depends if you measure the traffic on the cache or if you measure the, tr the load on the OSMF servers. Uh, the, the load on the OSMF servers is proportionately a bit higher because mappers tend to view new things that other people haven't, or they are viewing areas that have just been updated. That's what we do. Yeah, this can be. Everyone is also trying to, to check uh, the new, also the new mappers and try, also try, trying to check if they, they, the changes are really on the map and if they really yeah. do, there is yeah. they really save the, the, the changes. Yeah, and the biggest advice I can give you is if you're waiting to see the changes, first of all, wait at least two minutes because it won't be <laughs> there otherwise. But second of all, uh, if you just hit the refresh icon on your browser, it doesn't actually request anything from the server. You generally need to do either a shift refresh or a control refresh, depends on your browser. Uh, and that will actually send, if you're on osim.org, that will cause the request to go back to the render servers and you'll get new tiles. Yeah, exactly. This is a, a very common question that people ask in new buffers when they reach, uh, they arrive in new chat or say, I, I done changes, but I, I refresh the page, but nothing changed because in reality, you're just using the cache that you have already in your browser. Yeah. Okay, uh, another question that I see about the QGIS. Uh, on QGIS, uh, osm.org, you briefly uh, quote something about money, I think cost. What was the actual co the, the cost actually relating to, or how this is calculated? I believe that is something I'll, if you could explain a bit more about the the, the, the topic that you touch, touch about the, the cost of uh, the, the use of the type. Yeah, that was based on what the cost would be commercially if you were, if you had a website and you wanted to go to, and I didn't base it off one specifically, but it wanted to go to a commercial provider of map tiles at, with that many tiles, it would be fairly expensive. Um, you could, in, in either of, I mean, they don't the commercial providers don't provide quotes for that many tiles uh on their website but the it would be something in that ballpark um it's not how much we spend to run the infrastructure that is a lower amount we're a non-profit we're volunteers and uh, we don't have the overset overhead of uh, something like sales uh, or, yeah. or for that matter, development, because OWG doesn't develop the software. We are responsible for planning the servers and stuff like that. The sysadmins run the servers, um, and uh, we're not, we're, we don't actually develop the style. Okay. Yeah, I believe it was a very interesting uh approach at least to estimate uh, the, also the amount of traffic and make it more more concrete, uh, more uh, more than big number, just uh, something that we are, everyone uh, could really understand. Okay, we have another question about, uh, do you think it's it's feasible to calculate a ranking of tiles similar to QRank of a Wikipedia page visit, say uh, at Zoom level 18, from base map users, not mappers? Um. We don't have a good way to to break it out specifically for uh, non-mappers. Uh, what what we do have is the 
the I mentioned it in the talk the tile logs, which show the which basically are a list of all the tiles that have been requested at least ten times from three different IPs. And we've resumed. I said in the talk we ha hadn't resumed publishing. Since I recorded the talk, we have resumed publishing. So it's possible to pull up um, to generate images like this. Let me share it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I believe that you can start and then later. Uh, so will be these, visible. yeah. So this is uh, this is uh, which tiles have been viewed at Zoom ten um, or eleven, twelve, and then I have one for fifteen. This is for Zoom uh, fourteen, and. Uh, this is, in many ways, a correlation with the population uh, on the internet, although there are differences. Uh, it's more Europe heavy. Um, Zoom 16, uh, you start to run into the problem that these images are start to be thousands and tens of thousands of pixels wide. <laughs> um, but you can do this. And someone could do this for Zoom 18, for example, fairly easily. Uh, you just have to decide how do you process it. Um, we've published the data, and there are people who are using it. For example, does it, I believe it's disaster.ninja uses it with um, other data to see what areas are being viewed in OSM but are undermapped. Um, there, are, there are other uses. Uh, my visualizations are just fairly crude ones. I did do a set of uh, interesting ones on um, this was just using Zoom 10, but um, where people from different countries are viewing. So people from Australia are mainly viewing Australia, Brazil, China, Germany. Uh, Germany is there's a lot of people viewing from Germany, and my scaling's not the best, but. Uh, so that's one reason why it looks like there's a lot more viewers outside uh, France, Great Britain, uh, India. I looked at that on a couple of days. Uh, Iran. I Iran is actually a big user of our, um, and I think part of that is because um, Iran is underserved by uh, traditional mapping companies for uh, sanction reasons. Um, Ireland, uh, Japan, uh, Poland. You can see uh, Poland is one of our bigger countries. There's a lot of people view from Poland viewing uh, ad adjacent countries and Russia, which uh, nice graphic, show, nice map actually showing the different hotspots, which would be cities and the routes connecting them, which would be roads or railways. And the U.S. and South Africa. Very, very interesting. But also, so people were uh, appreciated so much this map because also they show very interesting approach. So also, are real practice that people from country can see from what they see image from the other country. Also, the light also show how much a country using that. It's also the, the different tiles, the different uh, usage of the tile at different levels. Yeah. And each picture, each pixel on these maps is uh, one tile. Um, yeah, there is this strange uh, straight line. Uh, the, the, there are some oddities, yes. Uh, so you get a lot of views at zero zero, zero. zero um, which is also known as Null Island. But you also have this band going up and down from there. And I'm not sure what that is. It's um, not the. The, the, I can tell you, I can tell you the requests are coming from Germany, but I don't know. I haven't really investigated in detail. Or there's this, bit, there's this line going between zero zero and a place in Mexico. Um, and what's interesting about that is you can see it here, but you can also see it. Um, if I go back up to, you can see it on other zooms as well. And only when you look at all of the zooms combined. Does it form a solid line? 
Okay, so a different zoom, like a combination of zoom arriving to the place. I don't know, maybe yeah, some, but... some automatic script that move from zero, zero to a location and clothing yeah. some tiles. Yeah, there, it's, uh, yeah, a lot, I mean, there's a lot of curiosities. There's more things here than I have time, to, than anyone has time to investigate. Um, yeah, exactly. When priority, priority has, has to be keeping, keeping everything, everything running, running and, and uh, uh, scaling up and stuff, stuff like that. that. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Also, as, as you said before, this data published, right? So maybe also other people could try to investigate and discover maybe someone from a particular location, a particular country can understand and look in maybe to recognize some pattern and some pattern and some particular issue. Yeah, the, 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 the we, publi we publish uh, tile access numbers every day. Um, and uh, yeah, you can download them, you can see how they there's, There's lots, lots of things, things you could do. You could see how, how they change between weekdays and weekends, all, all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, just only limited time, so can't do everything. Could be something like uh, to investigate for, for there are multiple approaches to, to, to use this, to explain, yeah. to start with the data and explain what I'm seeing uh, uh, seasonal patterns. I don't know, maybe some season, in winter, maybe some other, some location of more latitude in summer, some others. I don't know. Yeah. Could be some... we, only, we only have the child log data going, well, right now it's only going back to the beginning of the month, but we're going to back populate it to April. We don't have data before that because our logging system was different then. And um, yeah. Yeah, the, the numbers wouldn't be meaningful. Yeah, there will be. This, this this issue could be done in future. We are launching idea for future presentation for future. Yeah. Okay. We have a, a last question that I believe that in part you reply. Uh, that say, what do you mean by fakes and what is the problem with them? I believe this is something with the, with the bots. Yeah. So a fake is going to be some program or some script that is pretending to be something else. So typically they're pretending to be a browser, but it could be um, it could be a, a script pretending to be some other script or something like that. And there's two problems with them. One is that they're doing something they shouldn't. Uh, I mean, our terms of use say don't do that. Um, it's bad idea. It screws up our metrics. But the other is those fakes also tend to be scraping the tiles, so just downloading one by one every single tile. Um, and they can put a uh, hundred, I mean, a hundred times more load than a, no, a normal user easily, um, or even even more than that. Um, and when they get, I mean, one or two isn't an issue. The issue is if when it gets out of hand, it it can be a problem. So that's why we have measures in place that detect them and block them. Um, as, as well as just the general fact that it makes looking at the health of the service and looking at what's going on much harder when you have uh, users hiding or users pretending to be other users. Um, I saw as, two, other inter two other interesting questions. I saw that uh, in the other part, I don't know if it disappeared. Ah, okay, the last one that appeared now, that was also in the chat. If, uh, uh, can you make the estimation which amount of mapper of the user come, uh, comes from not mappers? You say that around 80%. You explain maybe something more about that, about the, how you calculate this, per, this percentage of how many people are, say, you say before that it's something like coming not from editors, so you estimate this is not mappers. Yeah, so... It's difficult to estimate, and there's two numbers. One is the amount of one is the people using the service. Um, the other is the load that the OSMF has. So, and they're different because the mappers tend to per load of the map actually put more load on the service than a non-mapper because they're statistically more likely to be viewing something new that's not cached. Um, uh the they um so i think i have some numbers on this um 
and I will get back to you with precise numbers in the uh, in the post talk because yeah, exactly. I actually I, do, I actually do have numbers worked out for that. Okay, perfect. So maybe if you're interested in exactly more number, yeah, later there will be more space in the, the post talk chat that you can move later to this place. There are also other factors such as if if there was some big user that only had where there are people viewing the map only did it in the middle of the night that might add a, a significant number of users but it wouldn't change it wouldn't impact our costs for example because we have capacity in the night we we have to be scaled up for uh the middle of the day yeah and there is like you say that these but you based like this time to the utc or like because most most of the of the Thai user come from uh, from Deutschland, so you it's for Germany. You say that this is like the the time that you are referring, like midnight and midnight, midday um, and midnight. More specifically, it would be the local time of the server. So in Europe, we have the traffic served from servers that are in Europe. So all of Europe is within an hour or two of the same time zone, basically. So it. It doesn't. I mean, it doesn't really matter. Whereas in North America, that's all served off of a server in North America, and in Asia and Oceania, that's served off of a server, in a couple of servers in Australia. So, it's really the local the local time that matters for when the load is. Um, I don't. I don't have great figures for that because. I, I we weren't logging sufficient information for me to do time zone corrections to uh, turn stuff into the local time zone. Also, that is a great deal of work. <laughs> um, but I, I, it's something I'd like to look at at some point is uh, when the pe when the peaks are. Very very interesting. Also, we are launching new ideas. So as I said, this is all open because uh, you have time. You have the, the, the data are available. Are not so old data. But from now, this data will be available and updated. Also, another interesting thing that was proposed was to uh, to check how load type, how many load type load is uh, done because there's both uh, latitude and longitude. So maybe someone wrote the the wrong uh, the wrong position, and so maybe from a location, how much load is done in the corresponding one inverting latitude and location and longitude. So. There is a new question. Uh, okay, Max, you, you talk about map map proxy. Uh, can be seen uh, as a scraper. Is map proxy okay with our uh, usage policy? So map proxy could be de could definitely be used as a scraper, and w w some IPs have gotten blocked because of that. Because you can set up map proxy to populate its cache, which is basically scraping. Um, however, if you're setting up map proxy to be a proxy and you aren't preloading it by scraping it, then that's not the behavior of a scraper. It's also, I would say, at this point, because we're on a commercial CDN, it's probably not necessary that anyone runs their own proxy in front. Uh, we have enough capacity on the CDN and it if you're using the CDN you're sharing the cache with a much bigger group of people and it's one less thing for you to run so I under, I understand that there are people who would like to run an instance of map proxy to cache their traffic to reduce the load or, or other things but honestly it's um, it, it's not necessary these days with the changes to the architecture and uh, there are that's not to say that there aren't ways that you can help. It's just that that particular way is uh, not so relevant anymore. Where we need really need more help is uh, more people doing the work. And I had something on the last slides about how, I mean, we've got meetings every other uh, week, not partic in particular about the tile service, but about all OWG stuff, or you could help with developing the software or stuff like that. That's how, so, so uh, that's what would be mo more, much more valuable than uh, someone setting up a map proxy server in front of their load. In Thank I you. Would say, I would say unless you are on extremely limited internet and have a fast local network, 
but then you're not going to be scraping because you have local you have limited internet okay thank you very much uh, paul for the for all the talk for all, all the reply to the question for for the data that have been provided by by the teams uh, and also the, the whole idea that we found uh, for for people that would like to investigate the data and to propose new talk i live uh, we will be back in five minutes with uh, the, the next talk, but you can find Paul, uh, I say for sure, in the post-talk chat room that we, he, he will present the others, the other numbers and maybe more information about uh, how to classify non mappers, so all, uh, all this stuff that was talked that we have, he, he has to check a little bit the number before sharing it. So uh, thank you again, Paul, and see you in the, in the post-talk chat, chat room.